Good morning. If you haven't yet found your seat or your standing area, please do so. We've got a lot of stuff to cover this morning, so I want to get rolling as quickly as we can because we still got to cover it, and we'll just stay here till we're done, right, Marissa? You what? If you guys have uh, enjoyed the shift in weather, some of you are sniffling. Feel free to get up and help yourself to a cup of coffee and orange juice. Just pray for those folks that you're missing this morning. 
I want to take just a few minutes and just pray for the people that you're missing. Whoever's on your mind right now, for whatever reason that you're missing them, I want you to just take a moment and pray for them. So, just pray a little bit to your, on your own for the people that you're missing. Oh, my God. 
lethargic today. Are you lethargic? Is that the last two big word? You're bumming me out, dude. I mean, I look at you and your faces are glum. It's like you drug your butts out of bed to come to church and you kind of sat on it. Except Aurora, she's smiling. Aurora's smiling and she had a bunch of kids to get ready. So the rest of you should be happy to be here. I do hope that you are glad to be here. And if not, you should be glad to be here. Even if you're not happy about it, you should be glad. There's a difference there. We should be joyful in our opportunities to gather together, to know that we're going to have um, the opportunity to have our iron sharpened a little today, uh, to contest some of our behaviors and to think about God's direction in our life. But we have to do it willingly. Nobody's going to force you to do it. So I, I, I pray that our attitudes are in line with what God would have us have them to be today. This next hymn is called, Are You Washed in the Blood? And I can remember singing this in my grandma's church with my parents, and I enjoy singing it with you all today. Are you washed in the blood? Let's sing it together. As you been to Jesus for the cleansing power, you want. Amazing grace, how 
like it's working here, but maybe not this. Some guy just get a hand up. to declare what Jesus has done for us in the symbolic act of the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine. We'll do so, and I would invite anyone that is a follower of Jesus Christ, who has been saved by Jesus Christ and made a confession of faith, uh, at the end of the service to come forward. If you've not made a confession uh, of your faith in Jesus Christ, then this would be a time that you could observe and think about that, but you wouldn't be participating in it. Also, for young children, uh, parents, you'll work to determine whether or not your child would be uh, one who would participate in the Lord's Supper as you come forward. All right, we're ready to go now? Good. All right, thank you. Sorry about the, the hiccup right there. Last week, we began to look a little bit at what happened when truth began to dawn on Luther. Gary, would you go close that door for me, please? Thank you. And as truth began to dawn on Luther, like it does with many of us, when we, we can still close it, they can open it. No, the outside door here. Oh, sorry, Lucy, you just got hit by a door. It's going to be one of those mornings, I can tell right now. So. When truth begins to dawn on us, sometimes, sometimes it makes us feel heavier, and sometimes it makes us feel lighter. When we know we're in trouble for something, or we get caught for something, that's a version of truth as well, and you have to deal with that. But when, as is the with Luther, you realize that something you've been carrying around with you, you don't need to carry around with you anymore, and you get to drop it, um, th then you should be full of joy and happiness. And this, this is really what began to happen with Luther. Um, I, I don't know if many of you have felt the same way um, as Luther did, but if you come out of a tradition of heavy religious practice, as many of my peers did in the Philippines, they, they were heavily indoctrinated and engaged in uh, in, in the practice of the Roman Catholic Church in the Philippines, when they met the grace of Jesus Christ headlong and realized that Jesus did all the work for them, 
And they didn't have to do anything to be saved, only to accept the grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They became very, very elated, happy. Their load was lightened because as Luther moved through life, he began to seek God. And the more he sought God, the more he realized he couldn't attain God. And that way it became very, very oppressive. Remember, he called God the jailer and hangman of his poor soul. The jailer and hangman of his poor soul. He now saw the overwhelming grace of Jesus. He knew at last the peace, the Bible says, that passes human understanding. And the overwhelming relief at discovering truth must have filled him first with joy and then with a desire to tell other people. So, don't let me just be white noise, guys. Come on, engage. Think about these things. These are powerful truths. When you begin to understand Jesus and you are free from your sins, you should want to do what? You should share it. You, you, should, you should literally want to. This is why new Christians so, are so hard to control. This is when somebody gets saved at Falls Creek or Men's Retreat or comes forward. They're just bubbling over and they want to tell everybody about it. Well, thank goodness that wears off and they calm down after a while. Thank goodness that you can, you can just find your place and become just another boring Christian. Aren't you glad we all calm down after that? And we, we, can, we can stop being so mouthy about Jesus in our lives and want to tell everybody. Isn't it, isn't it a relief just to know that these Christians will shut up after a while after they get saved? Does it offend you that I would ask those questions even tongue-in-cheek? Isn't it a little grating to ask that question? How, how are we so able to lay aside that joy that we first feel? We're going to be thinking about this today, so I want you to pay attention to this because it's one of the lessons that I think we can take from Luther and the Reformation. As clear as his own salvation in Christ became, so then did the incredible lostness and decay of the Roman Catholic Church come to him. As he begins to realize through the illumination of the Holy Spirit that he's been saved through grace alone, by faith alone, and then he would turn and look at his peers and his countrymen and all of those across Europe and say, Oh my God, this is backwards. This is wrong. We must do something about this. Despite the fact that all he had known, all he had been trained in, and all that he had previously believed, he was still able to see God clearly. Despite this, the scales came off of his eyes because he sought the truth in Scripture, and he didn't just believe what the preacher said. He just didn't do what the church said to do. He just didn't follow tradition blindly. Luther began to seek the truth of the Scriptures under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This realization, as we can imagine, was wildly unpopular with those that were in the middle of benefiting from the status quo. In fact, they demanded that he recant. Now, recant just doesn't mean you say, I'm sorry, my bad. It literally means that you say, I lied, I believed, and I taught something false, and I turned from this. Luther said he couldn't do it. He replied this, I cannot choose but adhere to the word of God, listen to this, which has possession of my conscience. A little aside, wouldn't it be remarkable if the word of God had possession of all of our conscience? Nor can I possibly, nor will I even make any recantation, since it is neither safe nor honest to act contrary to conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. Amen. Now the setting was that he had just gone through three days of grilling at the hands of the toughest church lawyers known to man. And at the end of it all, he stands and says, I cannot go against my conscience, which is founded in the word of God. And it seems so clear now with hindsight that the church had as it so often seems to, lost its first love. The church had lost its first love. You know, when this happens to us individually, we return to our worst love, ourselves. When we lose our first, we go back to our worst. And this inevitable gravity to return to our own selves, both individually 
and institutionally is at the heart of the corruption that Luther confronted, and it's at the heart of our own individual need for frequent personal reformation. So pay attention to this. This is not just a historical deep dive into Luther and the Protestant Reformation that happened 500 years ago on Halloween or thereabouts. This must be applied, or you could just go read stuff on Wikipedia or, or a biography that if we don't apply these truths to our lives, then they have no, no value. All of our lives would indicate that we are creatures that need to practice with conscious diligence the disciplines that would keep us from reverting to a version of our worst selves, our physical selves. We need attention to diet and rest and exercise, or we will see our bodies begin to move toward poor health, right? Oh, now I'm, now I'm meddling. Now you're going to be quiet and look down. If we don't take care of our bodies, what happens? They don't work well. They don't recover well. And then we moan and groan about what's going on with our bodies. Oh, I'm just going to live fast and die young and leave a good-looking corpse. Well, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll live to the ripe old age of 35 or 40 or 50 or something. And then what are you going to do? If you haven't been taking care of the vehicle you're walking around in, it will not take care of you. We must pay attention to our physical selves or we will suffer the consequences. All right, I'll move on because that's uncomfortable. Baptist preachers shouldn't preach about stuff like that. How about our intellectual selves? You know, our founding forefathers said it is so critical to the development and maintenance of a democracy that we have an educated citizenry that we will make education compulsory. What does that mean? It means, kids, you've got to go to school. Not just because your mom is trying to get you out of the house, although that's a good byproduct sometimes, but because our founding forefathers said, stupid people don't run stuff very well. You might be intelligent, but you may be dumb as a post because you never learned anything. You've got to learn how to read and write well, to stand and deliver, to think deeply and critically about the world around you. And if you don't, people will run your lives for you. If we don't maintain our intellectual health, our academic pursuits, we will get dumber, y'all. I promise you. Some of you that have been out of college for a while, why don't you go back and take the ACT and see how well you do? Oh, now you're getting squirmy. I think we should make all school board members take the ACT. What do you think, Gloria? Don't you think that's a great idea? <laughs> how about all legislators? I almost had a revolt in my hands at one time in a faculty meeting. I said, all right, we're preparing our students to take the ACT, right? And everybody said, yeah, we need them to score well, right? Yeah, okay, you guys are all taking the ACT. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. Why not? Why do you think a teacher that wants to, why do you think they didn't want to take the ACT? Because they're scared, right? They're, we might find out that the great Oz is really not who we think he is behind that curtain, right? Because we know that if we don't keep our minds sharp, our minds will get dull. And if we spend so much time staring at this stupid thing, we will get stupid. I promise you, listen to me, some of you staring at it right now. Oh no, I'm stimulating my mind. I doubt it. Most of the time we're not. It's cotton candy we're putting in there, not nourishment. Uh, by the way, a long time ago, like 10 years ago, they used to think that your intelligence was fixed, that you were born with a certain IQ. Now we don't think that way anymore. We know that it's not nature or nurture. It's nature multiplied by nurture. It's intelligence multiplied by environment. You literally can make yourself smarter. That makes some sense, right? We know if we work out our physical bodies, we can become smarter. We can maximize our potential with our, our endurance and our strength and our skills. Why not our minds? God put us together the same way. So if we exercise some diligence in our physical selves, our intellectual selves, what about our emotional selves? If you don't take care of your emotional self, what happens to you? You can be wrecked. You can be wrecked. You can give in to sadness or anger or hatred or hurt until you maintain with a healthy emotional diet. You cannot be healthy emotionally. Now, all of these things may make sense to us then so why are we then caught off guard by the fact that we are victimizing ourselves by the willingness we have to obey our own spiritual health 
what happened to sap our original spiritual health and vitality, which was present when we first encountered Christ. I'm telling you, back to that original idea, when you first become a Christian, you're bubbling over. I remember the night that I became a follower of Jesus Christ. I came outside of the church. The first person we encountered, my dad was the associate pastor. We walk up to the head pastor, and I was grinning this like 360-degree smile. I could not stop smiling. And I was a second grader, first grader maybe. And this guy was intimidating to me. But I had to tell him what had happened in my heart. And I didn't have words for it, but I wanted to express to my pastor what had happened in my heart. How willing we are now to suppress that joy that we once had. So I want to think about the context of the church during this time having lost its way and what occurred by overlaying it on our own lives as well. And ask you the first question, how did the church lose its way? The Roman Catholic Church traces its roots all the way to the first century and claims the lineage of the first followers of Jesus Christ as its guiding models. The simple, profound, and freeingly ignoring, excuse me, the necessity of staying directly plugged into the source is what, of the gospel is what got them lost to begin with. Carelessly allowing those who say they speak for God to do so unchecked against the word of God and in accordance with the Holy Spirit. They began to accept that whatever was said must be true. And those who were in power began to think, I can say whatever I want to say and it could be true. And we can maintain power this way. In fact, we can increase power this way. You know, this is not the first or last time that this would be the situation. Look at the words of John in Revelation 2. As he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them to be false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you've not grown weary. Yay, church at Ephesus. Wait. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. They lost their first love by taking their eyes off of this. You see, the church in Ephesus at that point was commended for its actions. And yet, the Holy Spirit said, but this I hold against you. You've lost your first love. You have become an empty shell of what you once were. At one point, your actions were driven by your relationship with God. Now your actions are just tradition and works. They are no longer driven by your relationship with God. Hollow religion had replaced a vital relationship with God. Well, I wonder, where do we end up when we lose our way and head off course? Where do we end up when we lose our way and head off course. I thought about this a minute. And I thought, it doesn't matter. Because where we end up is anywhere other than where we're supposed to be. We need not worry about dealing with where we are if we are now focused on retaining our footing for where we belong. Because you see, so much of our practice in religion are the do's and don'ts. Or we think they are. And we try to find a right relationship with God by doing stuff. Instead of establishing a right relationship with God and then just seeing what stuff we're doing as a result of that. It's a completely different way of thinking about this. A young man who is deeply in love with his young woman 
doesn't have to be trained a whole lot about how to win her affections. There is an understanding about the way you treat someone that you deeply and truly love. You don't need a manual. On the other hand, if all you do is just do something that was written down and there's no actual affection behind it, you can see right through it in a moment. It doesn't matter nearly so much where we end up as it does that we are now focused on returning to our first love. We seek to renew our first love, and the rest will generally work itself out. And even if it does require specific focus, because we've got some things in our lives that require some help, like an addiction or toxic relationships, these things are overcome through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives under the instruction of the Word. But we have to seek those things first. I didn't get this as a young man, and sometimes I don't get this as a not as young man. That it isn't about behaviors, it's about relationships. That the more I focus on my relationship with my wife being healthy, the more my behaviors to my wife are in line with that relationship. If I'm just thinking about some sort of robotic or autonomous behavior list, do these chores, do these things, it doesn't flow the other way. It doesn't create love. If I only hug my kids because I knew I was supposed to hug my kids, not because it was an outflow of love for my kids that produced the hugging, it would be all wrong. It would be an empty hug. When we begin to seek God and follow God, the behaviors that result from that are the right behaviors. And the negative behaviors fall away. Again, many of us, how far can I go? What can I get away with? As opposed to, let me pursue God wholeheartedly. This, the church began to do this. This is what occurred when the hollow behaviors of church leadership led the entire church off course. Well, what are the evidences of us having lost our way? What are the evidences of our having lost our way? Nancy Wolgamuth Moss provides a helpful have lost our first love. They are clearly in accordance with the indictment by the angel to the church in Ephesus. I want you to take these right now. I'm going to go through them quickly. And if they irritate you, just make a mental note. Because there's a lot of them here that irritate me. And I don't have time to bear down on them, but I want them to bear down on us, so pay attention. For the evidence is that you may have left your first love. One, you can go hours or days without having more than a passing thought of him. Number two, you don't have a strong desire to spend time with him. Number three, you don't have a strong hunger for the word. Bible reading becomes a chore, something we mark off on a to-do list. Number four, spending time in prayer is a burden or duty rather than a delight. Number five, your worship is formal and dry, lifeless, merely going through the motions. Six, private prayer and worship are almost non-existent. They're cold and dry. Number seven, you're more concerned about physical health, well-being and comfort than the well-being and condition of your soul. Number eight, you crave physical food while having little appetite for spiritual food. This woman is a, is a meddlesome woman, is she not? By the way, if you've never heard her teaching, she's phenomenal. She is phenomenal. Number 10, you spend more time and effort on your physical appearance than on cultivating inner spiritual beauty, which would please Christ. Number 11, your heart toward Christ is cold and indifferent, not tender as it once was, not easily moved by the word, talk of spiritual things, etc. Number 12, Christianity is more of a checklist than a relationship with Christ. Number 13, you measure spirituality, yours and others, by performance rather than a condition of the heart. Number 14, Christianity is defined more by what you do than what you are, who you are doing versus being. Number 15, your obedience and service are motivated and fueled by expectations of others or a desire to impress others more than a passion for Christ. Number 16, you are more concerned about what others think and pleasing them than about what God knows. And pleasing Christ. Number 17, your service for Christ and others is motivated by a sense of duty or obligation. Number 18, you find yourself becoming resentful over the hardships and demands of serving Christ and others. You can talk 
number 19, with others about kids, marriage, and weather in the news, but struggle to talk about the Lord and spiritual matters. Number 20, you have a hard time coming up with something fresh to share in a testimony service at church. Or when someone asks, what, what's God been doing in your life? Number 21, you're formal, rigid, and uptight about spiritual things rather than joyful and winsome. Number 22, you're critical or harsh toward those who are doctrinally off base or living in sin. Number 23, you enjoy secular songs or movies and books more than songs or reading materials that point you to Christ. Number 24, you prefer the company of people who don't love Christ to the company and fellowship of those who do. Number 25, you're more interested in recreation or entertainment and having fun than in cultivating intimacy with Christ through worship and prayer, the word, and Christian fellowship. Number 26, you display attitudes or are involved in activities that you know are contrary to Scripture, but you continue in them anyway. Number 27, you justify small areas of disobedience or compromise. Number 28, you've been drawn back into sin habits that you put off when you were a young believer. Number 29, little things that used to disturb your conscience no longer do. Number 30, you're slow to respond to conviction over sin, or you can ignore it altogether. Number 31, you enjoy certain sins and want to hang on to them. You're unwilling to give them up for Christ. Number 32, you are not grieved by sin. It's no big deal for you. Number 33, you're consistently allured by certain sins. Number 34, you're self-righteous, more concerned about sin in others' lives than your own. Number 35, you are more concerned about having the right position than the right disposition. Number 36, you tend to hold tightly to money and things rather than being quick to give to meet the needs of others. Number 37, you rarely give sacrificially to the Lord's work. Number 38, you rarely have a desire or burden to give when you hear of legitimate financial needs within the body, your church, or a ministry. Number 39, accumulating and maintaining material things consumes more time and effort on your part than seeking after and cultivating spiritual riches. And number 40, you have broken relationships with other believers that you are unwilling or have not attempted to reconcile. Wow. Wow, as I read this list and reread this list and read this list again and a fourth time and then now a fifth time, I began to see the evidences in my own life of having turned from my first love. These are things that as a brand new believer in Jesus Christ are almost inconceivable. If I were to read these things to a young person or an adult who found Christ and felt the the beauty of the grace and the redemption from their sins, these things would not even be things they would conceive of doing. But we as Christians, those who have been in relationship with God, if we have failed to maintain our walk with Christ, we'll begin to slip down this pathway of falling away from our first love. You see the church at Ephesus on the outside had it going on, you all. They were doing everything that a church, that a group of believers was supposed to do, and yet God saw right through their actions. They said, you're not in love with me anymore. You act right or people think you act right. And you've made some, some behavior decisions that are good, but in your heart of hearts you no longer love me. Return to your love. How do we get back on track? How do we get back on track? If this is indeed us or our families or our church or our denomination or, or our, as was the case the entire Roman Catholic Church, how do they get back on track? It's not rocket science. We're sheep after all, right? We have to have a willingness to even consider this. Once our defensive response to something like this begins to subside a little bit because this hurts, then we have to have a willingness to acknowledge that we have a problem. We have to acknowledge it. Once you acknowledge it, 
you have to confess it. I'm sorry. This is the way to correct behaviors, to move on. When you mess up, you have to acknowledge it and apologize. You confess that. I'm going to give you a small example, right? Some of you will find this amusing. I'm just going to confess this. And I was going to do it earlier, but I'm going to do it in front of everybody right now. All right? Last night, my children and my wife and my niece are watching a movie. We have Bose sound systems underneath it. That when you play a movie, you play it through the sound system so it really fills the house up with sound. And as they get up to go to bed, they don't turn off the Bose sound system. They lost the remote control. So I want to watch the news, and I turn on the TV, and it is just booming out of the Bose sound system so loud. I'm sure some of you can hear it at your houses. I hate not having my remotes where I left them. And my children specialize, and I think my wife consorts with them, to lose my remotes just to make me go crazy. So I was fussing and fuming and hollering and yelling and throwing stuff around and lifting the couch up and going. I was angry that they took, and I think it was Lydia, actually. So this morning, when I am folding up the shorts that I had on last night, I noticed something was in the pocket of the shorts. Oh, you think you know what it is, don't you? The Bose remote remote was in my pocket. My mind immediately said, one of those little rats planted that in my shorts. (laughs) I promise you that's what I thought. Because I had absolutely no recollection of what my my wife had said happened. When we went upstairs, that remote was sitting right here. I said, then where did it go? We were upstairs. Nobody snuck in the house and stole the remote. But apparently some idiot, when he walked by, picked it up and put it in his pocket and went upstairs. I apologize to my family for my attitude last night. All of y'all. For my attitudes, my behaviors. I was wrong, I was right, and I just kept going wrong. And God, with his sense of humor, wanted me to find that remote this morning so it would fit this sermon right now. I already know what happened. I acknowledge what I did was completely out of line, bad attitude, bad behavior. I confess it, and I'm asking for your forgiveness. So, family, you decide if you're going to just take away all the remotes from me. I may have to buy you ice cream or something. i got to fix this, all right? So you admit that you have an issue. You confess it. You acknowledge these things. And then I would say that what you really need to do is you need to rest, read, and listen. Rest. Read and listen. So I want to get my life back in, in good alignment with the Father. So what do I do? I'm going to go to a seminar. I'm going to download a podcast. I'm going to read some theological. I'm going to tell you right now. Sometimes the most important words to us are when we just rest. We read his word. And then we shut up our brains and just listen. We rest. We read and we listen. Father, just tell me what you need to tell me. I just want to hear what you want to tell me. Stop talking and I will. I just need you to tell. Okay. Listen. Listen. And once we have heard it, we need to obey and renew our walk. Obey. I I heard that, but I don't really want to do that, right? I I know what you're telling me to, to tell my family about this thing in my, no, my, how about this? I like, this will work, right? We begin to negotiate with God on these things. I, 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 I really want to do that. I'll do this. How about this, right? We begin to bargain with God in some crazy way when you hear what he says. No, I don't want you to watch that stuff anymore. Okay, what if I just want, I just, okay, but I'm going to keep, but I'm going to do this, okay? Yeah. I'm going to be really good here so I can, back to that list of things that, show that we've lost our first love, we negotiate down with God when he said, look, you asked me what you wanted me to tell you to do to align your heart with mine, and I told you, so listen. Now finally you just repeat, because as far as I can tell, there's no end to our stupidity. Our mind, anyway, I don't know about y'all. There's no end to it. 
we, we go along this way and we continue to move forward in the right direction. We get things rectified and we coast along for a while, but we stop paying attention to maintaining these things and we're beginning to drift off course. I may or may not have told you this example last week, but I remember so clearly as a, as a triathlete struggling when I was in open water because when you train in the pool, it's easy because you're looking down and they paint lines on the bottom of the pool. So you follow the lines in the bottom of the pool. I can swim straight when there's lines in the bottom of the pool. They put lane markers to your right and to your left. You can even look at the lights on the ceiling and know how far you go. Almost. Sometimes you hit your head on stuff when you do that. At the end of the lane, they put a little T. You know, you're going to turn around and come back. It's pretty easy. But when you get in a lake, especially Oklahoma Lake, there's no lines in the bottom of the lake. There's like Loch Ness monsters and stuff down there. Weeds and mud and rock. And you begin to swim and there's waves and and it, again, if it's an Oklahoma lake, you're tasting boat fuel and mud. It's not a clean lake. And you're paddling and swimming as hard as you can, head down, perfect form. And you look up and realize, I've been going the wrong direction for a minute now. How is that possible? I know I swim straight in the pool. When they teach you outside, when you, when you swim outside, you always have to look up and spot the buoy every few strokes. They say every 10 strokes, I had to do every five because I was always like this to the water. Every 10 strokes, you spot the buoy. So you know to correct because of the, the people that are kicking you in the head and the currents that are coming across you and the wind and the waves. And in our spiritual lives, we must repeat this process continually so that our course is corrected. Luther said this, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. Though all my heart should feel condemned for want of some sweet token, there is one greater than my heart whose word cannot be broken. I'll trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever, for though all things shall pass away, his word shall stand forever. If we focus, he was pretty good, wasn't he? If we focus on him, the rest tends to take care of itself. The scales fall away and we see clearly. Our hunger shifts to the right kind of appetites and away from those that are promoted by the world. I don't have time for this. I'm busy. I got things to do. I got work. I got kids. I got family. You know, Martin Luther said that too. He said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. I am so busy, and I have so much to get done that I'm going to pray three hours a day. It's a joy to have others on this journey with us. But I can tell you right now, brothers and sisters, it is not a necessity. If you were alone, Robinson Crusoe style, marooned on an island with no access to technology, no books to read, and no other human beings, all of these truths would still be self-evident in the people of God. But your heart and mind have to be aligned to God. And if you were completely by yourself, the need and opportunity for personal reformation would remain intact. Well, what waits for those who return to God? The pleasures of God. Deuteronomy 30, 30 verses 1 through 10. This is where you can sort of get fired up about what God could do for you if you follow. Because he's a good Father, he's a good God. He's a great boss. He is one who rewards us. This is what he said to his people. And this, whether this is a, a direct dictate to what would happen in your life or not, I'm not certain. I'm not saying that God is this like one-armed bandit. You put in a quarter and you get the jackpot. That's not what God is. He's not a, a good investment in the stock market. But the nature of God is reflected in this passage. So pay attention. Deuteronomy 30 verses 1 through 10. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart, with all your soul, according to everything I commanded you today, then the Lord will, your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, and gather you from all the nations where he scattered you, even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens. And from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous 
and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow his, all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you the most prosperous in all the work of your hands, in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. So when does God make his people prosperous? When we and our children and our descendants turn with all of our heart and mind and soul to all of his commands. There is a need, I believe, for immediate reformation in many of our own lives. Even if we're in good, a good place, there is always an opportunity to walk more in line with our God. The blessing of our lives, and I believe this is a blessing, is that we can draw closer and closer to him all the days of our lives. I mean, we can look at it this way, that we can never attain perfection. Or we can look at it this way, we can always have the opportunity to improve. You know, physically, our bodies decline. Mentally, our minds begin to lose some sharpness. But spiritually, as long as we can still draw a breath, we can take another step towards sanctification, being made holy in Christ. Until our last heartbeat, we can continue to move toward our Father. We do this through the guidance of the Spirit and a relationship with Jesus founded in the Word of God. And I ask you today, will you do so? Luther didn't intend to start a big fight. He didn't mind it. He was kind of a brawler, it turns out, intellectually speaking. But he found such freedom in Christ when he got this thing right that he could not stand to allow anyone else to remain in darkness. I wish we had the fire of that reformation in our bellies as well. This morning I'm going to ask as we come forward to partake of the Lord's Supper in a few minutes that you genuinely think genuinely think about the reformation that God would have for you in your heart if there is correction to be made then make it today if you have fallen away from your first love and become a victim of your worst self. The beauty of grace is that it is infinite, and our second chances are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in amazing. He can give us another opportunity to move our lives in the right direction. So whatever you're bearing today, you may lay down. I'd like to ask our ladies to, to play a uh, an invitation song for us before we move into our Lord's Supper. Would you stand, please, at this time? Oh, come to the altar, the Father's altar, open Jesus is coming. Oh, come. 
Sunday morning, having been pulled so many different ways, to feel the unity that comes when we all start to think about you. Thank you for giving us a focal point, uh, direction, giving us marching orders and admonishment and guidance and encouragement that bring us all together. We pray that we are a body that works diligently to serve in the communities that we've been given to serve, that we work faithfully in the relationships that we have been given in our lives with our families and our friends and those we work with to show them the love of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity this morning to be able to commemorate your sacrifice for the observance of the Lord's Supper. In your name we pray. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, we hear the following words about Jesus Christ and his actions that Paul passed on to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 says, For I received from the Lord... What I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a beautiful gift from God to be able to celebrate, to commemorate, and proclaim the gift of Jesus Christ until he comes. I'm going to ask that you will come forward and receive both the bread or the cracker and the cup and return to your seats. And I want you to take a few moments of your own time to... Think through your position before the Father, his sacrifice for you, and the opportunity to commemorate that with the Lord's Supper. The passage in Corinthians goes on to say that your heart and mind need to be clear of sin before you partake of this. When you've confessed your sins 
and stand before God in the position that you need to be, then I would ask you at your own time to, to take both the wine, the juice, and the bread or the cracker and consume those and then sit quietly until everybody else is finished. Time is if you'd like to come to the table here, line up and we'll distribute the bread and the wine.
Lord, it has been good to be in your house, brothers and my sisters. And I pray that you cause the peace that passes all understanding to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we give you thanks. We give you our attention. We give you our lives. Amen. Good to be with you, my friends. Have a great week. We do have house church this evening. Please feel free to join us. And then Wednesdays, we love having you serve at Western Hills when we help with children and young people as well.